Today we're going to talk about carbon. So let's get started. Hey, how do you like that new intro there? I hope you like it. If you do like it, go ahead and give me a thumbs up or go ahead and comment down below. Let me know if you like the new intro and the new logo. So today we're going to talk about carbon or carbon in our soil. What is it? What does it do? Is it important? Try to watch it from beginning to end if you can to get the most of the information that I'm going to try to provide you. I'm going to try to make it not so long and drawn out, but it, it might be. Let's start our first question. What is carbon in the soil? Carbon is the main component of soil organic matter and it helps um, it helps give the soil its water retention cap capability and structure and its fertility. That is in contrast to what they call active soil carbon, which resides in the top soil, the topsoil area, and is in continuous flux between microbial hosts and the atmosphere around it. What form of carbon is in the soil? Organic carbon includes decaying plant matter, soil organisms, microbes, and carbon components such as sugar, starches, carbohydrates, waxes, resins, organic acids. How much of the soil is carbon? The things that I've read about how much carbon is in soil, and it's going to vary per state, per location, per lawn, about 58% of the mass of organic material exists as carbon. They also estimate that the percentage of SOM, which is soil organic matter, from the SOC percentage, which is soil organic carbon, you, then you're using a conversion. I'm not the big math guy, but there's a conversion factor of something like 7.5 or 7. I think it's 7. No, it's 1.72 is what the conversion factor is. But anyways, just know that SOM is soil organic matter and SOC percentage is soil organic carbon. So why is carbon so good for the soil? Carbon is a main component of organic material which is going to help your soil with to retain its water. It's going to hold its structure and the fertility which we covered that at the very beginning of this. Some of the pieces of carbon are also going to be used to, to house microbes and we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. So then some parts of the carbon that is inside your soils are so stable that they can actually last for thousands of years. So basically once carbon is in your soil it's going to be there for thousands of years. Now there there is some faster used or faster absorbing carbon that may last about 10 years but the majority of it, I believe, will last thousands of years. Do plants take carbon from the soil? Plants get all the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen they need from carbon dioxide and water, which they use to build carbohydrates during photosynthesis. So the plants get these as well as other elements directly from the soil. Just like you do, our bodies. Plants build their cells from carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Do plants store carbon in soil? Carbon is sequestered in the soil by plants through photosynthesis and can be stored as soil organic carbon, SOC. Soil organic matter typically stores carbon for 
several decades. So what happens to carbon? How is the carbon sequestered in soil? Well, it's done through a process of, again, photosynthesis. And I hate saying that word because I can't say it. <laughs> Plants assimilate carbon and return some of that to the atmosphere through respiration. The carbon that remains as plant tissue is then consumed by animals or added to the soil when the plant dies and it decomposes. What is the source of carbon? Amending soil with organic carbon not only facilitates healthier plant life, but it also drains well, prevents water pollution, and is beneficial to useful microbes and insects and eliminates the need for using synthetic fertilizers, which soil type has the highest soil carbon content? Well, soil organic carbon tends to be concentrated in the topsoil. Topsoil ranges from like a half a percent to about 3% organic carbon for most soils. Soils with less than a half a percent of organic carbon are mostly like desert areas. So in the soils containing greater than 12 to 18 percent are considered organic carbon and are usually classified as organic soils or usually like garden soils. So again, let's just touch on how long will carbon stay in the soil. As we talked about a little earlier, there are different types of carbon in your soil. But roughly speaking, half of the carbon is short-lived and will last about 10 to 20 years. The rest of it is long-lasting and will last thousands of years. So that's why I say if you can add any carbon to your lawn or to your soil, whether it be your garden or your lawn, once that carbon is there, it's going to be there for thousands of years. How can the quality of soil be improved? Would you want if again you can't really do this to a lawn, but if you're a farmer or like in your garden, you can work three to four inches of well processed manure or compost, put that in your in your uh, garden and work that into the soil three to four inches. You can add at least two inches of organic matter every year and mulch, mulch to help retain the soil moisture and to keep it cool. You can use grass clippings as mulch to keep your garden areas cool. How do you increase it in your lawn? Again, you can let your lawn grow a little longer than normal so that you can force the roots to grow deeper. You can add organic matter to your yard. You can add compost or manure to your yard. There's also some other carbon products out there, some uh, biocarbon, stuff like that. Now, some of the biocarbons, you got to be careful because they're bigger chunks, and it'll take forever for those chunks to dissipate into the lawn. But we'll talk more about different soil amendments in another video. I just wanted to give you the gist of soil carbon and the importance of soil carbon, and I know it can be a boring subject, but I'm creating the video because it is a very important subject. So we talked about this briefly a little earlier. What is SOC? SOC is soil organic carbon. The levels are directly related to the amount of organic matter that's contained in the soil. And SOC is often how organic matter is actually measured in soil. So SOC levels result from the interactions between uh, several ecosystem processes of which photosynthesis, respiration, and decomposition are key. And that's kind of how this organic, this SOC is developed, this soil organic carbon. What is organic carbon? And we talked about what organic carbon is. Soil organic carbon is carbon that remains in the soil after a partial decomposition of any material produced by a living organism. Your lawn, a dead bug, a mouse. 
It constitutes a key element of the global carbon cycle through atmospheric and vegetation, soil, rivers, and the ocean. So there needs to be a way for us to figure out what we need to put in our soils. How do we do that? And we've talked about this a thousand times. Soil test. So when should I test my soil? It's a good idea to sample your lawn or turf in the spring or early fall. This will allow time to make fertilizer adjustments or lime applications or sulfur applications to make those adjustments before it's too late. So if you did it in the spring, you got all summer. If you do it in the fall, you, got, you still have like maybe a month or so to make some adjustments. Personally, I like to do my soil test in the spring before I put anything down. No chemicals, no fertilizers, nothing. Do my soil test first thing in the spring. Then I go ahead and start my lawn care program. That way, we already know where my soil is sitting at before I start putting stuff down. It will, if you do a fall soil test and you were able to make one adjustment or two adjustments, because it takes time to make those adjustments, it will also, it will also allow you to plan for your lawn program next year because you'll have the soil test results with you and you'll be able to make use that as your game plan for next spring. What would be the proper death? Well for lawns for it would be anywhere between like the upper six inches and then you want to make sure you you remove any plant residue, any dead grass or grass or leaves or rocks that are in that soil. So you put your your probe down. You want to you want to keep about six inches of that. I don't keep the very top. I don't keep the very bottom. I keep that middle section. Oh, John, I'll go ahead and put a soil test video up up here for you. So I, what should my soil levels be? We want to try to keep our soil strong and healthy. Phosphorus can play a crucial role also in the plant process like photosynthesis, respiration, and energy stored and transferred. The potassium, uh, it, the benefits there in, would include you know, increased root growth, the improved drought resi uh, tolerance, improved drought tolerance, and enhanced photosynthesis. Remember, the potassium is kind of like our overall immunity system of the plant. What is the recommended fertilizer ratio? So have you thought about that? And a good ratio for your fertilizer would be like a 3-1-2 or a 4-1-2. When you're looking for a fertilizer, you're going to look for that fertilizer ratio of 312 or 412. No, again, the first number being nitrogen, so a 3. The second number being a 1, which is the phosphorus. And the third number being a 2, being the potash. So another important factor when you're choosing your, your nitrogen fertilizer is what kind of nitrogen is actually in the product. Is it, is it a fast release? Is it a slow release? Is it a controlled release? Which is kind of like a slow release. So, so sometimes some fertilizers might include a percentage of fast release and then another percentage of slow release. So we've done this before in another video and I'll put it up there somewhere. Put it up there somewhere, I'll post it. But we're talking about reading fertilizer labels and we've gone over this but we know, and, and then featured on all bags of fertilizer, you have the three numbers on the bag. And those are your NPK. Now, you may not always be able to get the 3-1-2 ratio or the 4-1-2 ratio, but this is what you're aiming for, for, for a well-balanced fertilizer. Personally, me, that middle number, which is my phosphorus, will be zero at all times. As we know, my phosphorus is high zero okay so that's another important reason why to do a soil test the mpk ratio or numbers those represent the percentage by weight of the available nitrogen phosphorus and potassium in that fertilizer 
The fertilizer label also outlines the type of nitrogen that's in that, in, that's in that bag. Nitrogen may be in a water soluble or a quick release form, or it may be in a water insoluble or slow release form. So quick release nitrogen encourages rapid response or green up. If you're gonna get a fast release for, uh, nitrogen, it's gonna release fast, it's gonna green up your lawn really fast, but that is the fertilizer that's more than likely to burn your lawn if you over apply it or you apply it improperly. Fast release fertilizer, or really any fertilizer, but fast release fertilizer for sure, you will have a better chance of burning your lawn. Now slow release nitrogen is often a little bit more expensive, but it makes nitrogen available to the plant gradually over a longer period of time, requiring reapplication less frequently. So you're going to get a longer, you won't, you're not going to get that excite, you know, the, the three day green up, but you're going to get an even green for a longer period. What is the best fertilizer ratio? Well, we talked about that. We talked about the three, one, two. Nitrogen promotes vigorous growth and that attractive green color that we're all lusting for, right? So, but wherever nitrogen is lacking, grass becomes pale and becomes thin. And also with that slowed growth, increased vulnerability to lawn diseases. So and then phosphorus is important for the root growth and for early plant vigor. Potassium regulates the physiological process and permits more efficient use of the nitrogen that we're putting down. So a good example of like a 3-1-2 fertilizer will be like a 15-5-10. Whenever you're putting down your fertilizers, remember that's the nutrients by weight that you're going to be putting down. And again, and that's usually put down in weight per 1,000 square feet, right? So 3 pounds per 1,000 square feet, a half a pound per 1,000 square feet. So you need to know... The pounds per thousand, you need to know how big the area is that you plan on treating. So if you're going to do 5,000 square feet, how many pounds do you need? If you're going to put down 3 pounds per 1,000, 15 pounds of fertilizer for 5,000 square feet, right? The other thing is that you need to consider when you're trying to grow a green lawn or have a healthy ecosystem in your lawn or in your soil I should say because right that's what we're treating we're going to treat our soil to give us a lush green lawn so the other thing that we have to consider when we're doing that is our pH soil testing is the most effective way to determine your your lawn's pH also it'll tell you what micronutrients that you're lacking and the best fertilizer to use for your lawn. We'll water a few days before fertilizing. We'll wait for our grass blades to dry. And then we'll go ahead and we'll fertilize. And then we'll water lightly to wash the fertilizer off the grass blades and down to the soil, which will minimize potential injury to the grass blades and the roots. Again, you need to read your bag. Because if you're putting down a weed and feed product, you it may prefer that you water first, then you lay the fertilizer down, and then you don't water afterwards because you're going to want that product to stick to your grass blades, right, or, or your weed blades or whatever you got in there. So read your label, know what you're putting down and the proper way to apply it, okay? to get the best results. I've had people often ask me, how often do I fertilize? But regular fertilizer applications help maintain a lawn's attractive appearance and the, and the continuous vigorous growth. If you're not fertilizing on a regular basis you're, and it's lacking nitrogen or any kind of nutrients, the lawn's gonna look yellow and pale and it's definitely gonna be prone to weeds and disease. But if you're applying the fertilizer too frequently 
or you're over applying a fertilizer, it can ca cause it to grow overly vigorously and it's going to require a lot more mowing and that's going to lead to a lot more thatch buildup which can create other problems and it can also create nutrient runoff or fertilizer runoff which is what we don't want. Properly timing your fertilizer application and supplying the correct amounts of nitrogen with each application is necessary to maximize your benefits of putting down your lawn fertilizer. So when is the best time to fertilize? Well, fertilizer is best applied only when the grass is actively growing. So you know we've got the springtime, we're kind of growing here, right? We're growing at our peak, and we're coming down in the summer. Now we're not growing anymore, we're down this lull. So we don't really want to fertilize in this fall time when, it, when the lawns aren't growing as much. But when it starts coming up again in the, in the, sp in the fall, here, now this is our growing period again. So we're going to want to start fertilizing this period. So fertilize, 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 don't fertilize. Fertilize, 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 and then don't fertilize. So when your lawn is actively growing, typically from, well, let's just say March or April, depending on the, on the year, right, through June. And then probably like September through October, at least here in Minnesota. So again, depending on your grass and the grass species and stuff like that, where you live, you know, what state, area you live, what type of grass you've got. If, you're, if you have Bermuda grass and your growing season looks like this, Right? Yours is just the opposite. We have flat in the spring, doesn't grow very much, grows a lot right there in the summertime, and, and then flattens out again for the rest of the year. So your growth period is right here. So know your lawn, know what your growth periods are, and fertilize when your lawn is actively growing. If your fertilizer, if your fertilizer has a nitrogen in the fast-release form, then you can apply your fertilizer like every four to six weeks while the grass is actively growing. If you're applying a slow release fertilizer, then you can apply your fertilizer like every like six to eight weeks. And again, every lawn is going to be different. If you learn how to read your lawn, you'll be able to know about when your lawn needs what. The last fertilizer application that should be applied should be six to eight weeks before your first anticipated frost date. That's always a tough one because you just never know. You might think, okay, we're going to be getting a frost or it's in the news, we're going to get a frost. Or get your fertilizer down six to eight weeks before your anticipated frost. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I'm just going to cover one more quick subject. I'm sorry this video is so long and it's probably really boring, but if you could just hang in there and watch the video, maybe go back and watch it again. Very important that you kind of understand carbon and what carbon does and how important carbon is to the health of your soil. It doesn't contain any nutrients. Putting carbon down, straight car putting just straight carbon down, is not doing anything to give you any nutrients. But it's a building block of your soil, and you need it in your lawn, or you need it in your soil, to help you to help with everything else you're doing in your yard. And again, putting carbon down is going to create little bits of like little nicks and crannies those these little holes inside the carbon is a place where these microbes like to live right so the more of those you have you have life in your soil and you're going to have a healthy lawn once your the microbes die or any kind of life dies in your soil then you have dead soil it's dead right and you're going to have to reintroduce life to your soil don't let your soil die so the one last note I wanted to make was adding organic matter to your lawn. So if you're ever adding the organic matter to your lawn, you really need to wait until soil temperatures are 65 degrees and more because that's when your microbes and the fungus become more active. 
and they can be broke down easier. Soil microbes are good, and the fungi, some of these lawn fungus, fungi are good in your lawn. They both play a critical role in the health of your lawn. However, both of them need quality organic matter to survive. So I'm going to be showing you some other products uh, in future videos that will be part of this little mini series here and a project I have coming up that I'm going to be showing you. Um, and we'll talk about some of these other soil enhancements and we're going to do some experiments and we're going to try to see what different soil types and how things will grow in them. So stay tuned for upcoming videos, please. So, hey, with that, thank you for joining us here on My Green Lawn. I hope the video wasn't too boring for you and you made it through this entire video. If you did, congratulations. You just educated yourself. Thanks again for joining us on My Green Lawn. Go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button down below and subscribe to any new videos. And watch out for those new videos coming on down the line. Something you should be interested in. And with that, I'll see you in the green. You have yourself a great day. Take care.